Good afternoon, good evening. It's five minutes past the hour, wherever you are. So I think that we can uh, we can start uh, this um, this event, this uh, webinar. Good afternoon and good evening, uh, and welcome to the Baltimore Rotterdam Designing Cities conversation. I am Christina Murphy. I'm a professor. I'm an assistant professor at Morgan School of Architecture and Planning. In this in this hour, I hope that uh, together with my guests we will be successfully answering questions related to latent potentials, adaptive reuse, the role of designers, catalytic, catalytic uh, processes, and design strategies. Unfortunately, young Knicker from NDRDV is being caught um, by an urgent matter, so he's not going to be present, but he had contributed extensively last year, and our guests today will be extremely good and competent in continuing the conversation. The center of our critique in the is the city, and it's the community. For four Tuesdays until March the 7th, 18 architects from Baltimore, the US, and Rotterdam, the Netherlands, led by four international moderators, will, together with you, answer the question, how do architects design space for people? This question has been intentionally let general and open as possible, in order to have and provide some answers or some closures by the end of these, uh, this session. Before I move further, I would like to let you know that this is a recorded session. So please keep, you, keep yourself on mute and camera off if you don't want to be recorded. For those interested in getting AIA credits, please fill in the form that is being um, reported in the, in, the chat, in the chat screen. We do take questions. You can either raise your hand or ask, uh, or ask or type your questions on, on your chat. Kindly do so when the moderator open questions, uh, the questions. Today moderator is Sinisha Dar. Sinisha is an architect. He is an urban designer, a professor at UQAM School of Design in Montreal, Canada. He holds a degree from the Université de Montréal and Harvard. GSD, where he studied on Fulbright Fellowship. Tanisha has worked with a range of architect, um, with a range of architecture and urban designing firms, including OMA and McCrenner Levington in Rotterdam, residing at the intersection of urbanism and politics. His current research focuses on emerging paradigms of light urbanism and the notion of urban catalysts. Tanisha is a friend and I admire uh, his, his thoughts, his head, and I am getting always inspired by his uh, conversations. Tanisha, welcome and thank you for accepting my invitation. Please take the lead. Well, thank you very much, Christina, for the opportunity to be a part of this very exciting uh, project. Good evening, everybody uh, joining us from Rotterdam, the Netherlands and Europe, and good afternoon to everybody joining us from Baltimore and from North America coming from Canada, I'm trying to include us into this uh, great conversation. So uh, again, to everybody attending today, many thanks for joining us for the second meeting in the series of transatlantic conversations, asking and answering the question, the paramount question of how do architects design spaces for people, as Christina has mentioned. Today's roundtable will address this question through the specific lens of collective reuse meaning the art of reuse through community participation. The aim of today's conversation is to explore the roles of adaptive reuse in the urban environment, focusing on repurposed objects, buildings, and sites also found in urban public spaces in order to redefine and regenerate the city. We've seen how this process has played out in both the dynamics of the evolution of Rotterdam and of Baltimore, and today's presenters will help us have a better grasp of how all these processes happen. Um, the adaptive reuse of buildings and materials for purposes, uh, the adaptive reuse is the use of buildings and materials for purposes other than originally intended. Although adaptive reuse has a long tradition in arts and crafts, more recently, the environmental awareness and design for sustainability have revitalized the role of trash to treasures approach providing a wide array of contemporary urban design, which is an important part of today's city's sustainability. The adaptive reuse at the urban and human scale 
focusing on buildings adaptability and urban structures, as well as flexible and accessible public spaces in the city are paramount. In addition, is building the city is the art of orchestrating the social dynamics of living together, the notion of collective and therefore collective reuse and community engagement seem to be a particularly important aspect to incorporate and join and uh, uh, yeah, join to the notion of adaptive reuse. So we might sometimes throughout today's uh, conversation be uh, referring to adaptive reuse or collective reuse, but what we're really trying to do is to find an osmosis between the question of adaptive reuse and its role in a city as a social and collective project uh, that that gives us another angle of addressing the um, um, adaptive reuse. So today's uh, presentations will will explore collective reuse through its, as Christina mentioned, latent potentials, its social relevance, its sustainability relevance, its specific design strategy and dynamics and ultimately its impacts on the cities and communities. At the end of the session, we'll also have a chance to answer a few questions and discuss the potential of collective reuse as a catalyst for urban regeneration and different roles that collective reuse of industrial heritage, namely, can play and has played in the evolution of both cities, both Rotterdam and Baltimore. To, uh, today, we have three great speakers joining us to share their experiences and their views on this issue, uh, contributing uh, both the experiences of the European scene and the North American scene. Uh, each one of them will present uh, a fairly short uh, uh, presentation of about seven to 10 minutes in the form of what's usually called the Pecha Kucha, the Japanese style presentation, which gives us roughly 20 slides to express a sequence of ideas and argumentary that will be open to conversations and answers uh, to questions further on. So uh, once we have all three presentations done, then we'll open the floor to questions. If you have questions throughout today's uh, session, please feel free to uh, put them uh, as they come to mind in our chat section, or you can also wait for the end of the, um, the, the all three presentations to ask your question. We'll do our best to include that in the selection of questions. We'll also let the panelists uh, engage in conversations between them. And as a moderator, I'll have to do my job and chip in with a question or two and bring up a subject or two that really uh, brought uh, uh, on which uh, all three presentations tend to converge and join or that we see significant differences in what they are presenting. So without further ado, as time flies, I'll uh, present each one of our three panelists today, Megan Elkrat, Evan Weivel, both coming from uh, Baltimore, and Duzan Dupel, Dupel uh, who is joining us from, uh, from uh, Rotterdam. Uh, Megan Elkrat holds a, a bachelor's degree in architecture from Kansas State University. In practice since 2005, she's a licensed architect, a legacy uh, uh, lead uh, professional, and an adjunct professor of architecture at Maryland Institute College of Art. Uh, in 2010, Megan founded Present Company, an architecture firm that focuses on historic renovation, adaptive reuse, and commercial and residential work. Megan has also worked as an architect led lead developer on small residential projects as well as on commercial projects in Baltimore City, including alley houses on Latrobe Street and the CoLab workspace in Old Goucher. Evan Vivell is the founder and principal architect of East Wing Architects based in Baltimore, Maryland. Evan was born and raised on a family dairy farm in rural Maryland and began his career, career at an early age, building barns and small structures with his father, his family spending summer breaks during high school and college working on construction project. Initially uh, formed as a design build studio in 2016, East Wing was a natural continuation of these early experiences in construction, pragmatism, hands-on creativity, and self-reliance. East Wing Architects' work 
uh, touches on a range of scales and styles, primarily focusing on creating meaningful spaces and places that reflect an intimate and empathetic relationship between creator and consumer, specifically within the vibrant Baltimore urban landscape. Evan is a frequent critic at Morgan State University and Catholic University School of Architecture, where he received his uh, Master's of Architecture degree. And turning to Rotterdam, um, warm welcome to Duzan Doppel. Uh, Duzan was uh, born and raised in Johannesburg, South Africa. Uh, that very context of South Africa with the extreme climate, resource and water scarcity and poverty make a circular and inclusive design approach in this context, context a necessity. It was during his student years that he developed a fascination for climate and resource efficient design. He brought this circular and inclusive design approach with him to the Netherlands when he immigrated in 1996 to work with MVRDV architects in Rotterdam. Keys, not knowing that they would start an office together in 2007. Doppel Strikers is an interdisciplinary studio focusing on interior, on architecture and strategic urban interventions. Their radically local design approach leads to tailor-made solutions on different scales in which their circular and inclusive design agenda is explored. So many thanks to all three of you for joining us today. Uh, the sequence that I would propose for today's presentations would have us first start in Baltimore with Megan and then cross to uh, Rotterdam and have Duzan share his presentation and then come back to Baltimore with Evan before we open the floor to questions and discussion. So Megan, thank you for joining us and uh, feel free to share your presentation. The floor is yours. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I apologize. I do have a bit of a cold, so hopefully sound legible or audible. Okay, are you seeing my screen? Yes. Fantastic. So this obviously is not, um, this first image is not something that I designed. This is not Baltimore, this is Palm Springs. But I placed it on here to remind myself that ultimately, while for me, um, adaptive reuse is often about the physical building, what we're really talking about here is people and community. And this is just a very quick um, story. The, the moment of this photograph was, uh, for me, I was on a road trip with my family. We were meant to leave really early in the morning but we wanted to extend our visit with uh, my sister and her, my brother-in-law. So we said, let's, we'll get coffee. Um, we'll stop so we're quickly. We stopped at something, you know, it was very cute, but it was very small. There was nowhere to sit. And the barista somewhat flippantly said, well, you can, you can sit out back. So we walked past the bathrooms through a back door and we were faced with this, um, which was just this incredible moment for us. It was uh, unexpected. It was this oasis. And we ended up spending a couple hours there and getting on the road very late. So um, these moments of, of magic and discovery are, are something, particularly with outdoor space that I've been thinking about a lot lately. Now, <laughs> while this may seem like a pretty large contrast, um, this space is actually a project we worked on a few years ago. Um, that was all about outdoor space. And I, I will have an image and a few slides that'll show you a broader view of this. But this was a uh, pizza bolis, obviously, and um, nothing against pizza bolis. I've actually ordered pizza bolis pretty recently, but you know, they, they weren't really activating the site in a way that um, that was engaging the community. This is across the street from a very popular food hall. It's in a, on a busy intersection. It's in a very walkable neighborhood. And so it was cars in, cars out. It was very car centric, delivery drivers in and out. Uh, so someone purchased the building and they, they really just weren't sure what they wanted to do with it. They just knew they wanted to activate this corner differently. So um, what was very cool about the project is it ended up becoming something called the Remington Storefront Challenge. So the owners presented this opportunity to give free rent to anyone that could put together a business plan and show how they were gonna engage with this space. So as architects, we were you know, asked to do something for an owner who was going to 
give the lease away for free. So in other words, the attempt was what little can you do here and make this, uh, you know, pleasing, which, um, you know, we, we do have that challenge asked of us from time to time. So, you know, initial conversations were, what if we just paint it? What if we just remove this, that, and the other? But this was a moment for us to really, our role is, is one of exploration in the beginning. So this image honestly is the most important one I'm gonna show you today. Um, <clears throat> I shoved my phone, I shoved my hand with my phone into the wall and was able to take this picture to show that there was actually something more exciting going on inside of this building behind the ethos that was on the front. And I, you couldn't see this with your eyes. This was like, it looks bigger than it is, but it was, a, it was a very small hole in the inside of the building that we were able to get people a little bit excited about the idea that maybe peeling some of the layers off would, would be beneficial. And then we did further research. We found the Sanborn maps that show at one point this very cool canopy that was on the gas station. And then my partner actually found the image on the right, which was a an auto accident. Again, it's very car centric corner and there were mostly like auto um, retailers on the other three sides, but we were blessed with being able to see our own building in the background of this shot, um, showing the two overhead doors. We knew that the back wall was curved and these um, cool curved brick uh, jams of each opening. So this was enough to convince the client um, and the owner to remove some of the layers and do some, and really like restore what was underneath the building. So this is what we found. And then we continued to find, find other really cool things like these round windows, the, the building had transoms, and then this really bizarre open web, web joist structure that radiated out from a central column. And this is kind of an aerial view to give you some sense of how parking centric the site was really the building is like you know a quarter of the entire site and regrettably <clears throat> everything i'm showing you today is, is just something that i think is is relevant to our conversation so a lot of it is not like our beautiful glossy images that we bring a photographer back in to show this project included a landscape scape architect intrigue they did this amazing job with the landscape i'm not taking great pictures of the landscape so i'm just apologizing up front that i don't have wonderful pictures to show what they did with all of this space but this is what the building looks like today. For, um, for the initial storefront challenge, the, the winner was the Cahoots Brothers, which was a collective of artisans that were using the space to both show their wares and like train and have events. This did happen like right before COVID. So a lot of those events were initially um, put on hold, but I was able to come to a few of them and they've actually moved on very recently, they're going to a different space and this building will be um, offered to somebody else, but I have, and there's a few more of the building finished. Um, I did have the opportunity to go hang out with them before they moved out and they had live, live music, they had um, pop-up vendors in the space and you can kind of see those radiating joists with the lights like following the radiant pattern. But it's just a very, um, like I said, this this whole event also activated the outdoor space in a way that I didn't capture because I was kind of there just to hang out with the client and have a good time. So I wasn't taking great pictures, but this whole event led out into the outdoor patio and they had food and drinks out in the outdoor space and people were navigating back and forth. I'm sorry. <laughs> the second project that I wanted to briefly touch on is called The Parlor. And this project is, has a lot of different layers to it. So I, I honestly could do probably like four or five different discussions on this project, but I'm gonna try to focus on the exterior and the, and the way that it engages with the, with the outdoor space. Um, the interesting thing about this project is that it was a, most recently a funeral parlor. So um, the inside of the space has a grandeur to it. And then the back of the space um, actually, fronts on what in Baltimore we call graffiti alley. So this building has like a very like, you know, front and back, very different dichotomy of two sides. This is the historic building. So originally it was built as part of like several four story structures. This is the last one standing. And this is what the interior looks like today. So there's a lot to hold on to here. There's a lot of like great bones. The, the building doesn't need to be completely transformed, but we are looking to not have a funeral parlor there. So we're figuring out ways to engage with the, you know, the aesthetics of that and, and transform that for a different user. 
And then you can see as, as you go back, you get into like the back of house uses, the embalming room, the lift, the casket lift, and then this large garage. So the interesting thing about this project as far as siting goes is it sits at all at the north and south boundary entirely of its site. So there is zero outdoor space and there's, um, there's no real way, there was no way for us to get people off of the fourth floor and out down the alley because the historic building does not extend as far as this garage. Let me come back to that actually. Um, so one of the things that we're doing is we're cutting half of that garage out and creating an outdoor car courtyard. Uh, it, it benefits us to add the outdoor space and it also helps us get people off of the fourth floor. Now, the other really interesting thing about this project is that it's already being used. So it's already sort of being transformed by people who are doing pop-up events there now prior to the construction project. So this next photo is actually taken from an art exhibit called Memento Mori. And already we're being able to engage the street level, even though for a long time, this, this sort of corner of the street has been pretty quiet. This is how we imagine it could be used once the renovation is complete. There's a very wide sidewalk in front of it. So there's plenty of space for outdoor seating. Again, the challenge really architecturally is not the space for it, but like how to make this feel like an active part of North Avenue because it's been a little bit more dormant up until now. And then this is how we imagine activating the rear of the building. So we come into that courtyard space. So that's it kind of like gets back to that first image that I showed you of Palm Springs. There's this kind of secret moment, you know, where if the garage or if the gate's not open and you come through the man door on the left, you discover this space for the first time and that it's open to the air. There's another view looking out of the building towards that courtyard and a third view of that courtyard in the evening. So I think I was timing myself. I think I got close. <laughs> But yeah, I know we're saving our questions to the end, so I will um, pass the baton to the next person. That's great. Thanks a lot, Megan. So now we're crossing the ocean uh, to uh, Duzan. So Pratt. Right. I have to unmute and I'll just quickly share my screen. And then you have a Full screen uh, view of this? Perfect. Perfect. All right. Thanks a lot. Um, thanks so much for the invitation. Um, this is the second time I'm participating, and um, I thoroughly enjoyed it the first time. So I'm looking forward to, to a nice discussion with you. As um, Sinisha already mentioned, I was born and raised in South Africa. And as an architectural student, I was confronted with the harsh realities of the, um, uh, the squatter camps near to Johannesburg. And um, what you see happening, uh, people uh, are living in extreme conditions. They, 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 there's uh, extreme climate, uh, there's a scarcity of materials, and of course, um, they're in incredible poverty. So architecture uh, in, this, in this kind of context um, has a different meaning. The role of the architect is different. And what I learned there is that actually through architecture and through the way in which you organize processes, you can empower people, so you can create social and ecological value. Um, and there are certain design strategies that I took with me uh, from my experience in South Africa. So obviously resource efficient design, climate design, and inclusive design. And I moved to the Netherlands in the late 90s to work for MVRDV. So that's funny that Jan's not here, but uh, I was looking forward to seeing him. I worked there for seven years. And then I started my practice in 2007 with Elina Strijkers, uh, who was also a, a, an architect, an interior architect there. And we took these principles and we translated them actually into a Dutch context. Um, and at that time, it was quite unique to be uh, thinking about these topics. It was like 15 years ago. It's quite mainstream at the moment, but 15 years ago, it was enough to, 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 to position our company as quite a unique uh, uh, company. Um, and we apply these principles on different scales. So uh, all of the projects that we work on, we try to incorporate these, these ideas uh, in some way or the other. But I'd like to focus on a couple of transformation projects um, because that's more on key. The first uh, reuse project we did was um, uh, quite an interesting one. It's a, 
an inner city block uh, two minutes from the central station in Rotterdam. And what's unique about this block is there's a very large um, park in the middle of it, um, which is very unusual in Rotterdam. Mostly everything is separated. So this is one large park. And um, the, the client approached us and said, you know, can you help us? It's a, it's a space of 30 meters deep, um, nine meters wide, um, and they wanted to live in it. So in terms of roles as architect, it was quite easy because it was very direct, but it was an incredible challenge because of the building regulations. It's a, it's a, it's a space that's not really designed as it's designed as an ambulance garage and not as a, as a home. So what we did was quite simple. We basically opened it up on the street side and on the park side, which is like a no brainer. And in the middle, what we did was where the darkest part of the house was, that's where we created a warm heart. So we created an extra level by going into the ground and creating a dugout as a kitchen. And then floating above that, we made a kind of a huge light bar that emanates, uh, emanates light. Uh, and those are the bedrooms and bathrooms. And in this way, we actually uh, utilized the darkest part of the house, but transformed it and opened it up totally to, to the outside. So from the street, it's actually a very yeah, a neutral uh, street aspect. But kind of, it's not the most dynamic uh, uh, place uh, or street uh, to live. But there's quite an interesting sequence of spaces. As one goes in, uh, you're drawn into the depth of the space, and you see the effect of this light box moving down into this dugout, which uh, the client chose the color, which is orange, which is also the national color uh, for Holland, which we were incredibly pleased with, of course. But that's incredible what it does because it radiates light, and uh, it actually becomes, you know, this, you know, the song you always find them in the kitchen at parties. Well, that's really the case here. This is like you can sit with thirty people on this uh, on the staircase, and then obviously moving towards this amazing garden. So this was, in a sense, uh, as a reuse project, it wasn't such a challenge in terms of participation. It was more challenge in terms of complexity um, and, and building regulation. So it was quite a nice testing ground. Um, Rotterdam is an interesting city because, as you know, it's a harbor city. And in the 70s, the harbor, uh, which was an inner city harbor, moved to the sea, to the Maasvlakte. So what happened from the 70s is that all of the uh, shipping industry actually slowly started to migrate towards the new harbor at the sea, which left a huge kind of vacant space in the city, just off center, uh, very close to the center of the city, actually, with lots of uh, uh, industrial heritage. And what you see happening is in these uh, inner city harbor locations is these old buildings are becoming the catalysts for urban renewal. Um, so here to the top left corner, there's a Jobs Fame, which is an old building, which became the anchor point for the whole urban redevelopment of the Muller Pier. And on the bottom right, the Phoenix Food Factory, which is a fantastic placemaking uh, activity, which actually led to the project on the right, which is the Phoenix uh, Loads, which is an uptopping on top of an industrial building by, by a colleague uh, architect, uh, May Architects, a very good uh, architect from Rotterdam. So this is a very interesting transformation. And these are quite close to the, the CBD. And the next location uh, will be um, the Merve Fee Havens. And this is a very special project uh, that we did quite some time ago, actually. It's called the Haka Recycle Office. And we were asked to uh, design a, a convention center on the ground floor. It's about a thousand square meters um, as, a, as a hub uh, for clean tech uh, companies. And actually the idea was to create a hub and hustle and bustle in this area. And that would be a catalyst for the district development. And what came out of that in a very long process over a decade, because this project is already a decade ago, um, is a, an urban plan for the whole uh, master plan for the for the whole area. Um, so this was quite an interesting um, placemaking exercise. And what we what we did was instead of doing an interior uh, uh, using uh, new materials, we wanted to connect to this idea of clean tech. So we said, let's look at this notion of closing city cycles. And we actually um, sourced six buildings which were up for demolition in the district. And we, um, we designated materials coming out of those demolition projects for our project. So um, that's quite interesting because it means that our design process was reversed. It was a supply driven process. So we had the functionality of the convention center, but we had to work with the materials that were coming out of the demolition projects. And maybe the most uh, uh, interesting part of this project was actually that we built it with ex-convicts in a reintegration process. So these are unskilled labor 
that are building the project, which means we had to design um, very simple details and we had to do a lot of repetition. And this led to a very interesting interior that um, had we done it with new materials, we wouldn't have, 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 have actually re, re, uh, been able to achieve this result. Because what you see is through the repetition and through the richness of materials, there's actually a sort of craftsmanship that emerged from this reverse process. Um, a very labor intensive process with a lot of participation from stakeholders, but this is a top down process. So we were engaging with the Clean Tech Delta, which was actually uh, financed by local government, the municipality and the Port of Rotterdam, who are the, the landowners in this whole area, 270 hectares for the urban redevelopment. So it's quite different to, I think, what happens in, in, in your uh, context, which is much more bottom up. Uh, this was quite a top down uh, development and we were quite quite lucky to get this um, uh, commission. Moving a little bit away from Rotterdam, but I wanted to show this as a sec, uh, one, of the, one of the last projects. Um, this is a, a temporary museum that we designed in Valbeek, and um, it's, uh, it's called SLEM, which is the Shoe and Leather Museum. And Valbeek was famous for its shoe and leather, leather industry. And there was a lot of resistance from the local community um, uh, for this project. So we organized workshops with all the stakeholders and one of the interesting things that happened was that there was a group of young yeah, adolescents who were kind of loitering on this, this, this square, quite intimidating actually, and we managed to engage with them and we got them actually involved in the process. So we got them to do what they're best at doing, which is uh, the demolition. And uh, they did a fantastic job. Um, and because it was a, um, a temporary museum for four years, we were operating on a shoestring budget. Um, so we had to come up with a concept which would be iconic with a very, very low budget um, and would also um, uh, work as a kind of way of promoting uh, this museum so that it could make after four years a step to a permanent uh, museum. And what we did was we, we basically just stripped the whole building with these young guys. And um, what we did was we painted everything in this beautiful wet blue color. And this wet blue is actually the color of leather when you tan it. Before you dye leather it, you tan it and it becomes this wet blue. So there's a kind of narrative and a reference to um, the process of, of, of making leather and shoes. And what was interesting about this project was that we um, leased the furniture. So it was the first time that we actually went, had a circular lease construction with the owner or the supplier of the furniture. And what was nice is that the museum doubled as a showroom for them. So there were price tags hanging on the furniture. So you could actually buy pieces of furniture from the museum. But we had a very beautiful array of vintage uh, uh, furniture for the duration of the, the four year project. So a very simple um, uh, strategy, but uh, it worked quite well. Beautiful with the, with the wet blue. And then the final project I want to share with you is actually not Rotterdam either. It's Amsterdam, but Holland is so small. I mean, it's all it's all kind of in proximity. But it's an interesting project because it's a, it's a, it's a, an example of a reuse where we actually combined our fascination for climate design. Um, so it's obviously the red structure in the middle, which wasn't red when we when we got there. It was a tin factory and it had been standing dormant for many years uh, and it's on the Reiterkade, which is the back on the back of the central station in Amsterdam. It's about a five minute walk from central station. So it's an incredibly central location. And um, there was a very dynamic group of people, um, creative uh, people from the creative industry who had this idea to create a club. Uh, a kind of a club, like a society, where you could um, have a, um, a membership uh, with different degrees of, um, how can I say, uh, different levels. So the idea was to create a restaurant on the ground floor, and it became a very chic uh, restaurant. Then the first floor was a lounge where you could work for a couple of hours informally a day. The next level was more fixed working for longer periods of time. And the top floor was for conferences, workshops with two hotel rooms and what we did was um, we did this op topping on top of the building which is a lightweight steel and glass structure and the client wanted a landmark he said I want people to to uh, to see our building from the central station so I wanted to go up to the maximum building height but there was no budget and the foundation couldn't handle that so we built a, a chimney a solar chimney out of glass and steel up to the maximum building height which lights up in the evening making it quite an iconic little building 
But at the same time, this is part of our natural uh, ventilation principle. So we use the solar chimney to naturally and passively cool and ventilate uh, the, the upper levels of the building. Uh, here, just an image of the, the ground floor, the restaurant. Uh, we worked together with these creative people. So it was a co-production. So there was a graphic designer. He chose this color, the red, it's actually his choice. Again, clients in Holland love uh, love vibrant colors. So there's no there's no scarcity of that there. And we also worked with an interior designer. So it was a very interesting uh, co-creative -co process where also the end users were part of the process um, in the design phase uh, as a kind of sound soundboard. And I think for us, the most interesting part is, of course, that our fascinations for reuse and our fascination for uh, inclusive design and climate design all came together uh, in this project. I'd like to leave it uh, at that. Wonderful. Many thanks, Suzanne, for this great presentation. And then we'll be switching back to Baltimore and joining Evan. Cool. Can you hear me okay? Good to go. Perfect. Perfect. Somehow there is a, well, that works well. Got it. Great. Um, so yeah, first I'd like to thank Sanisha for the introduction and Christina for inviting me to speak today and discuss uh, my work creating architecture in Baltimore. One second. Cool. Um, my name is Evan Weivel. I'm an architect and founding partner of Eastwing Architects, a Baltimore-based design firm that specializes in contemporary residential renovation, adaptive reuse, and urban infill projects. Our studio is located in a former milk bottle cap factory that we now share with cabinet makers, fabricators, printers, coffee roasters, and other artists. We love reimagining and modernizing historic buildings, navigating challenging sites, and contributing to the revitalization of Baltimore's vibrant neighborhoods, one building at a time. Uh, our work is inspired by the industrious, beautiful, and complex history of Baltimore, fortified by the reality of its present context, and encouraged by the promise of a bright future. We feel a duty to contribute positively to the enrichment of our communities and seek clients who care deeply about the quality of the spaces they inhabit within their walls and beyond. This presentation contains a series of photographs I've taken over the years highlighting the sublime beauty of Baltimore's slowly decaying urban landscape a behind the scenes tour of parts of the city few see and even fewer appreciate. Most of the buildings shown are projects we're currently working on bringing back to life. As a Baltimore architect, the vast majority of our work involves the careful rehabilitation of abandoned or poorly maintained buildings in the city's core. Adaptive reuse involves transforming a building built for one purpose, often over a century ago, into something the community needs now. Even if the typology remains the same, an old house becoming a new old house, we're tasked with transforming and manipulating existing structures to serve new ways of living, working, and interacting. This particular building is the site of the Sphinx Club, originally a row home uh, before becoming one of the hottest clubs on the East Coast and the hub of Baltimore's Black Arts District. Eventually abandoned and left to the elements, we're currently working with the neighborhood and local developers to create a new community space in the spirit of the former club. Adaptive reuse requires an appreciation and love for the architectural history of a place. There's great value in the careful preservation of the character and culture of a city while reconfiguring existing spaces to serve the demands of the market now. Our approach to renovation projects involves many decisions, large and small, about which elements of existing buildings should be preserved and maintained, and we work to balance these elements with contemporary interventions. We seek to find creative solutions to merge old spaces with new programs. There's currently, there's certainly a cultural and aesthetic value to preservation and restoration, but also an environmental value. Adaptive reuse keeps buildings standing and out of landfills and reduces the overall energy consumption of construction. Our firm motto is at home in the city, which is a rallying cry for our mission to make Baltimore more livable and sharing our appreciation for the city with others. Charm City is just that, and there's a certain energy shared by the people who call this city home and are committed to positive change. We have projects in all corners of the city, throughout the Black Butterfly and the White L, and have found the most limiting factor we face is not creativity or passion, but economics. 
Rising construction costs and stagnant property values prohibit significant investment in the communities that need it most. One of the perks of the job is my ability to access and explore buildings in ways most never will. Many of these buildings are in an unhabitable and generally unsafe condition. There's not much adventure left in the practice of architecture, but my team and I are able to experience spaces in ways that were never intended, like this cavernous shell of a large gutted row home. This was a spiritual experience for me. The volume of the space reminiscent of cathedrals. Adaptive reuse requires visualizing spaces that may not yet exist, but are waiting to be revealed. This is another image from the same property. Uh, this time the structure that has been peeled away reveals the scars of a two-dimensional section diagram against the party wall. These buildings have memories and stories to tell and it's critical for architects to be quiet and listen. My team and I have become very comfortable in these spaces and have developed strategies to properly document them. While exploring these buildings, I feel like we've stepped back in time. Often these spaces feel outside of time altogether. There's something magical about stripping away the guts of a building to the point where only the essential remains, wall, floor, roof, and sun. As I mentioned, we're very comfortable in this, these spaces. This is a member of my team at an airsats desk in an abandoned row house. The process of renovation and adaptive reuse is often a process of peeling back layers to reveal the essential. As architects, we're tasked with assigning value to these layers. What is worth preserving and what is worth celebrating? The reuse of building materials often requires considerable effort and cost, especially masonry, which comprises the primary materiality of the city. From right to left, we see a clashing palette of the original red brick, the yellow optimism of a later addition, and finally unfinished plywood, indicating the space has been abandoned altogether and no longer safe for people. Buildings live and breathe and too often die. Our responsibility is to bring them back to life. Speaking of peeling back layers, this is a very Baltimore scene. Anyone who's spent any time in Baltimore will recognize Formstone, a synthetic simulated masonry product developed in the 1930s and popularized in post-war Baltimore. Advertised as a low maintenance alternative to brick, um, specifically, and this is a quote, weatherproof and insulating forever, first cost is the last, no upkeep or repair, lasting beauty for exteriors or interiors, tried and proven, fully guaranteed. Once a sign of prosperity in Baltimore's working class neighborhoods, most row home renovations involve its removal and the restoration of the original brick facades. As Formstone becomes rare, I find myself appreciating it more, uh, much to the chagrin of my wife, and find it to be an appropriate symbol of Baltimore's quirky legacy. This is that same facade uh, restored uh, and updated to accommodate a small garage in a neighborhood where parking is exceedingly rare. We left traces of the original brick lintels uh, as a memory to the original um, rhythm and configuration, and replaced the second floor windows per historic design guidelines. A third floor addition, which contains the living space, is barely noticeable from the narrow street it sits on. Another quirky feature of this house prior to the restoration is that the cornice was replaced at some point with a modified sewer pipe um, that was hidden behind the formstone. On the interior behind the second floor windows, a new partition curves away at the last moment to avoid conflict with the original window placement. This is a small moment, but harmonious, where old and new merge to form a new experience. In this way, adaptive reuse often happens behind the scenes of preserved historic facades. These interior worlds offer opportunities for private redevelopment without altering the character of the public street. Although in many ways abundant, the existing building stock is a finite resource that deserves consideration. In denser neighborhoods, tight rear yards with narrow alley access are common sites. We need to understand not only what is allowable by local codes in regards to setbacks and lot coverage, but what is possible in regards to constructability and site access for contractors. Zero lot lines and party walls require thoughtful consideration of and occasionally negotiation with neighbors. In this way, even single family projects in urban neighborhoods must consider the entire community. This is one of my favorite images from my explorations in the city, the shell of an abandoned home in West Baltimore transformed into a walled garden with sunlight entering the space in ways that were never intended. This is a great metaphor for the latent potential of underutilized or abandoned buildings, but also a poignant reminder that if we don't reclaim these spaces, nature will. 
in some cases, that may be the ideal scenario. We were able to replicate this experience with this project, a private residence in Fells Point. This is the same project with the formstone removal that I shared earlier. Our design created a um, hidden world behind the historic facade elevated above a walled garden. Um, I love this image of the same property uh, because it shows a variety of scales and densities found in just a very small portion of a narrow alley street. These row houses, for example, um, are about 10 feet wide. There's a larger uh, industrial building adjacent. Uh, this is another project of ours in East Baltimore, which takes inspiration from the industrial forms explored earlier in this presentation and the rhythm of the narrow row house streetscape. A custom mural pays homage to the workshop that stood on the site for nearly 80 years. Believe it or not, this is the opposite end of the same project, an early 20th century end of row carefully restored. Uh, it is in this spirit that we approach design, thoughtful consideration of culture and history, careful rehabilitation of existing conditions, and bold interventions that enable new life to emerge in our cities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Evan, and thank you to all three of you for these wonderful presentations. Um, what really struck me is the attitude, the presentations and the projects that you uh, shared with us today. They really present the practice of architecture in different light, really present the practice of architecture as a practice of optimism and of engagement, the practice of achieving the most social and spatial impact on the city with very often least resources and frankly least effort if possible. They share a practice of architecture as an empathy towards the existing city and towards the existing architectures. And in many of your projects, we see this attitude of almost an amnesty to the existing, which I, I particularly uh, appreciate. I have to say that also in each one of your projects, um, we see that the practice of architecture is a practice of building the city as a collective project. And all of these bring a very different optics to what our, being an architect is, what our roles are, um, and the scope of our practice. So maybe before, while we wait for uh, our audience uh, questions to come in, I, I would first like to hear you as to how do these uh, adaptive and collective reuse projects uh, change the, the perceived roles of architects? So perhaps to summarize the, the framework of the question is uh, the dynamics and the processes of collective and that adaptive reuse projects tend to be different than the conventional linear new built projects. The role of the architects offer often becomes much more multiple and it really ranges from that of the engaged citizen to community guide companion to the catalyst initiator, very often developer, as well as an intermediary, and sometimes simply as a professional, but it has a more present role. So what are the roles of architects that you've seen both other in other projects and particularly in your experience? What are the roles of architects in urban regeneration projects based on adaptive reuse and collective reuse? And to some extent, how does that change the scope and the model of architectural practice uh, that would be most often present in conventional projects? Megan, if, uh, if you can perhaps share some of your experiences, because I think you've acted in all of these roles that I've mentioned. Well, it's interesting that you ended the question with scope because then I, I smiled. You know, I think, especially with projects that have a limited budget, often the client's perception is I need a permit. I need to quickly begin the construction process, which, you know, inadvertently is like saying I would like to limit the design process. Yet, as you mentioned with adaptive reuse, this is not just I've decided to build this product and I have purchased this site and will build this product. You'd, you're, you're faced with people that have invested in something that already exists. They're, whether they realize it outwardly or not, are, are interested in that latent potential. So the, you know, if we talk about the Remington Storefront Challenge Project, the idea was that something be there and they weren't even really sure exactly what they wanted that to be. And they had this brilliant idea to let the public decide by, you know, by way of submitting their, their you know, applications. But so our role is, you know, in the beginning to advocate for that process, to advocate for that time, 
and to um, you know identify when our client is excited about the building. It's like sometimes the preservationist in me is, is well, let's remember why you wanted this property, why you invested in an existing building rather than just starting from scratch or being out in the county. You know, so we're advocating for the inclusion of the people and we're thinking about the end user and we're also advocating for the, the structure that's there and, and how it is engaging with its neighborhood. Because as much as people think of a, Baltimore as a city of abandoned buildings, it's also a city of people who stayed and who are the neighbors of these buildings. And it's important to like spend time on the site and get to know the people that are already there and to understand what some of the potential is, not just for the physical building itself, but <clears throat> for how it connects to these other spaces. So um, I think hopefully I've answered your question, but I think our role is to really um, lengthen the schematic design process. And, um, you know, again, sometimes it can be as simple as, I, you know, sticking your hand inside of a wall and and convincing someone to, to restore a building that nobody was excited about. And sometimes it's working with a really small business and helping them navigate, you know, I own a couple small businesses. So sometimes I have a retailer as a client and I will share with them what I know about running a small business in a way that might give them more breadth to their funding for a project or more resources for, for grants that would allow us to extend that design process so that we can get the most out of even a small project. That's great. That's design. Great. Yeah, I think um, uh, to elaborate on that, I think for me, there's a, there's quite a difference in the role uh, we play in projects uh, when it's a, a like a housing project where there's a private client, where it's a very direct relationship to the client, uh, to their wishes and needs and the object that we are uh, tackling, let's say. And to the, the larger projects that I showed where uh, there's actually our role um, is almost as a kind of lubricant uh, it's a political role yeah? because what we're actually doing for example in the Haka project um, that was actually um, creating a space as a hub for clean tech businesses to kickstart an urban development so there's 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 a there's a catalytic uh, function to that to what we're doing and our project is a demonstration of the ambitions for the reach for the whole district development so the whole idea of closing cycles for example is didactically illustrated in the interior that we made. Uh, so in that sense, I think it's quite interesting that sometimes um, it's it's more a political role that you're actually playing uh, than the role of the traditional architect uh, fulfilling your client's uh, desires and needs. Yeah, I, I think uh, Megan took the words right out of my mouth, honestly, with the, the idea of advocation. So I think the architect's role is obviously to advocate for their client, first and foremost, in any project. I feel with adaptive reuse, we're advocating for the building as well. Um, and that uh, again comes with a million little decisions that need to be made and judgments that need to be made and what's valuable and what's not. So um, I think Megan you know, spoke that you know, incredibly eloquently. Um, Samisha, I love your, your comment about optimism as well, which I think all architects have to be optimists, right? <laughs> it's a difficult process um, to, to get these things built. Um, even more so um, what I think a lot of people don't, it's, it's harder to recognize the potential of existing buildings, especially when they're in a state of decay. So um, I almost included this in my slide, but it wasn't a photo I had taken, but there's a, a warehouse uh, retail space on the south side of the city, right near the entrance when you enter the city called Second Chance that actually um, salvages architectural um, material, building materials for resale. And there's a mural on the side that says what is and what could be. And to me, that that's always struck me as essentially what what we do as architects in Baltimore City is is understand what is and imagine what could be. Absolutely, I, I'm deeply convinced that the practice of architecture and urban design is a practice of optimism. In all of our cities, we see how over a decade or two the city can evolve in very unexpected ways. We've seen how, for example, in Rotterdam, over the past decade or i would say two decades the city has evolved so this might actually take me to another angle of uh, of, of understanding this and this would be more specifically a question for duzan to understand and learn from rotterdam i'm trying to see what are really the roles and potentials of collective and adaptive reuse so in a city like rotterdam with such an abundant uh, uh, abundance of industrial legacies and and buildings of that industrial heritage um, what roles has industrial heritage and adapt adaptive uh, reuse 
played in the regeneration of the city. I think it, it, in many respects, it has contributed significantly. Immensely, immensely. Um, I, I had a couple of slides uh, illustrating the what the well what the impact was when the port actually moved to the mass fluctor. So when the the port was an inner city activity, but it's three hundred and forty five thousand jobs that moved to the periphery to the sea, um, leaving a void of industrial heritage and large vacant land, which in many cases also polluted. Um, and there are some beautiful iconic buildings um, that have, um, well, some of them got into a state of de decay, but those buildings are always the buildings that, of course, artists would appropriate. And you'd always get this kind of uh, bottom up placemaking activity because it's cheap, uh, you know, kind of, it's called ad hoc, like, um, what is it called? Anti crack uh, to stop people from squatting, anti squat. We have like an anti crack in Holland. So you can, for a very small amount of money, you can um, stop other people from squatting in buildings and you can live very cheaply. So these bottom-up initiatives actually are more normally the, the driver for a district development. But then what happens is the, the landowners uh, uh, utilize that and use it as a leverage uh, to create some kind of um, uh, placemaking on a, on a larger scale. So often these buildings are anchors uh, in, an, in an urban, uh, as, as a, like a catalyst. And they're the first buildings that get transformed and that around it generates, you know, their, their services, there's, um, it, 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 it generates a certain liveliness and around that then they can uh, add housing because we have a huge housing shortage. So normally uh, these become kind of mixed use uh, working and living uh, environments and they're very popular. So, uh, and what's happening now, the North Bank of the river is being tackled first because that's close to the central business district. But uh, one of the examples I showed was on the South Bank, um, uh, the Phoenix Loads and Phoenix Food Factory. And that became possible because the city built a bridge. So sometimes a piece of infrastructure changes the dynamics and the field. Uh, and suddenly that place became hot. The prices of that land went up and the, the housing prices just tripled in, in 10 years. Unbelievable. Perfect. So in the case of Rotterdam, it's really punctual. Uh, uh, regeneration projects that have changed the perception and dynamics of neighborhoods and gradually over a decade or even more uh, really helped regenerate uh, part of the city. Uh, in, in the case of Baltimore, a city with such an abundance of underused and abandoned sites and buildings, which was also the case in Montreal 20 years ago, and without that optimism, one could never imagine that that has evolved. And in Montreal, um, uh, uh, this tide has changed, and I'm sure that in Baltimore, gradually, that's a process that's underway. So I'm wondering, what is, uh, in your uh, view, Megan and uh, Evan, what's the potential of collective use as a catalyst for urban regeneration? And if I can add two specific angles, um, how can collective reuse be a strategic agent to strengthen and empower underprivileged communities, because that's one of the challenges specific to cities like Montreal and, and Baltimore. And in some cases, how can architects transfer a part of our agency, of our capacity or certain powers that we have to um, help orient, uh, to help communities and uh, orient and communicate uh this project that we're putting forward so ultimately what's the potential of collective uh reuse in regenerating the city is this I too wide? no no i think i mean i think the collective element is, is critical um i think especially in a city like baltimore that um it often feels like a very small town it feels like you, we just you know you meet somebody and you, you've already met, known them sort of thing um, and I think for me, um, you know, living in the city, um, I, I'm, I'm building my own city in a lot of ways. So I think to really get the energy behind a lot of projects, you need sort of more than the ind individual to get it going. Um, and that has a lot to do with the sort of economics and, and potentially the struggle to just to get projects going. So um, we've definitely found that the most successful projects are even with single family projects are, are projects that engage the entire community um, that get that get buy in from the beginning. Um, which allows the entire community to feel ownership. So to me, just, you know, from a, a big picture sort of philosophical standpoint is, is there is, there's really no individual in the city. Everything is so connected, literally one building to the next in many cases. So 
um, approaching a project sort of independently or in a vacuum without, you know, at, at the very least, you know, some sort of community interaction is um, is not off, often not a viable option. Yeah, and I, I, you know, I think what's interesting about it is that there are large scale projects that engage the community in a formal process, you know, where there are charrettes and there are, you know, firms that bring the community in to get feedback. And then there are these very, um, you know, DIY sort of small projects that I think maybe Evan and I tend to find ourselves more often than not associated with. And in that case, you know, it does go back to something I mentioned earlier about supporting small businesses with information, because I think especially um, in underserved populations, a lot of those uh, businesses and, and entrepreneurs have been going in alone, you know, without without resources. So, you know, I, I take on this role of, of trying to engage, uh, you know, connect people with the resources that are available. I'm just as both of you were talking, I was thinking of two clients in particular that I won't name that purchased a building rather than leasing a building. And then at one point during the process, we're sort of nervous about that. Like if I made a mistake, you know, but the thing that's really beautiful about ownership, and I say this as a person who also works regularly with developers who will be landlords and I myself am a landlord, but there's something about a, the idea of a business that is in the building it owns, you know, that is almost old fashioned and getting back to that creates an anchor to a business that that person then becomes like inherently part of their community. You know, they're not just, it's not a transient act. They're there for the long haul. So even if it's a retailer on a corner, uh, you know, they're, they're putting down roots and they're establishing a relationship with other people in their community. So there are moments where this, this community act is, is sort of, it happens. It's like, you know, putting a little crack in the armor and it happens slowly over time. But as you do that, as you make a personal investment into a neighborhood, you sort of convince other people that it's possible. You can help them understand how the process goes, what some of the resources available are, and you can start to like build a community that way. So I just think, you know, some of that even, so we own a building in a neighborhood and we have relationships with the owners of the buildings in this neighborhood. So, it, you know, there's not just the idea that we as architects are part of this design community. We're also like human beings that are part of a greater community. And what's cool about that is then you can use this professional knowledge to, you know, navigate, help people navigate that process, if that makes sense. <laughs> We're sort of like, you know, so the, the, the dynamics of projects that you're describing are radically, are quite frankly, quite different to, to the dynamics of many of the projects in conventional architecture practices. Somehow different roles that you mentioned, uh, in addition to those that I have mentioned, you uh, pretty much are an educator in some cases, both to the clients, but also to the community. You're the, uh, uh, the activators of uh, communal spirit and this, these dialogues and participation processes. You're the strategists, and to some extent, you're soft politicians involved in orienting the decisions. So when you look at projects like these, I'm just curious as to how different the, the design objectives are compared to conventional projects. So what are the most important challenges and success objectives in such collective reuse projects. You know, if in a conventional project, it is pretty much about a lot of the form and space qualities. In these projects, what are the specific design strategies and what are the specific uh, objectives that for you would make a project a success? Perhaps, Duzan. Yeah. Well, I think I think for me, the, the reason we are so fascinated with transformation projects is that um uh sorry someone's calling me uh is that um every building has its own dna you know it's got its own character and um we're always looking for um creating a way to create spaces that uh, touch you, you know as a, as a person that do something with you so you actually we're looking for ways in to create collective memory and collective experiences because that's what creates value and that's what, what, what binds people to a place. And that's what makes a building, for me, that's the essence of architecture. Uh, and what I love about transformation projects is you've got to work with the shell. You've got to work with the DNA and the character of the building. And it makes it a lot, in a way, it's, it's a lot more difficult for me than new building. Because with a new building, you've got, you know, you, you've, everything's in your hand. You can create whatever you want. And, uh, but I, I love the process because um, 
it leads you to have to make some kind of uh, ad hoc decisions sometimes. Sometimes there are these crazy constructions and it leads to something beautiful and unexpected. So I think that's, for me, the essence is creating meaningful space. And um, uh, obviously it has to function, but I think when it, when it has meaning, then uh, it has value. Yeah, I, I love uh, I love the idea of the collective memory of a building as well, and uh, you know I, I think about that a lot through just the lens of craft and the actual construction, the, the hands that created the building through through multiple iterations. And uh, like I touched on in my presentation, the building is a living thing, and it changes and it gets sick and it gets well and it, it, it's repaired and put back together and and often you know doesn't make it. So you know we become sort of stewards of these buildings, which and you know vis-a-vis -vis stewards of our city. Uh, one building at a time, but I, I think that that collective memory and that narrative is what's what brings value, and then we're just you know one part in a in a in a longer story that will extend beyond us. So in many ways, I think an adaptive reuse project or a restoration project is really just about you know I hope in you know 50 years or 20 years or 100 years or whatever if the the needs of that community change, the building can change with it, um, which is I think when you start to you know, you're working with buildings that are over a century old. Your your concept of time, I think, shifts a little bit um, in the, the value it can bring to the community. Yeah, that's a really good point. It's a, you sort of inadvertently thinking bigger picture when you're dealing with historic structures. I also feel like there's a there's a technical answer in there too, um, because as we talk about these other roles that we take on, and and to be clear, it's not we don't always I don't always have the answer. Sometimes it's simply me connecting someone to someone that does or a resource that does, but that becomes so business focused. But then the really cool part of the role is you also have to be very good at creating a gorgeous rendering that can remind the person of their vision and why they got excited about this older structure in the first place. So there's this kind of cool like way that we keep using new tools and finding different ways to. Um, navigate making you know images of buildings that are older like we have to go through and, and document all of the cool existing details and figure out how to quickly show what the client is sort of picturing and for me that's like the wonderful moment as as some as a project begins to get bogged down with with the regulations or the funding and these other hurdles that it starts to go through when it becomes more and more real there's this moment where someone will come into the office and we show them you know, maybe the first project progress shot and there's this like oh yes like okay this is why you know, you they have the vision, and it's it's sort of our job to like remind them of what that vision is and help it come to life. So those are these kind of magical moments in the design process. As a teacher, I have to say that these are wonderful lessons for all of those who are students with us, because ultimately, when we're at school, we tend to be very much uh, oriented towards the visual and the formal. While when we listen to all the suggestions and the uh, great advice that you're giving us, ultimately it, uh, understanding that architecture as a project and as a practice is about creating meaningful space and meaning, meaningful experiences, that we as architects are the stewards of the city and the stewards of the material culture of our societies, especially in these times where uh, we're facing a significant uh, challenge of sustainability and the fact that we are expanding much further than the resources that we have on our planet. So all of these are very valuable um, advice and lessons to the students uh, and to the professionals with us. So on that, I would like to thank you, all three of you, again, for these wonderful uh, presentations and thoughts and to all of the audience who uh, joined us for today's uh, session. And I think we ought to invite you for the next session that um, Christina will uh, just remind us when it is happening and with whom. Yes. Well, um, before I go there, Sinisha, thank you so much for leading this. And I would like to give one token, one last final token. The sensitivity in this conversation has been overwhelming as, an, as a spectator. Thank you very much for being so sensitive about this subject. I um I noticed I, I you know a few notes design with optimism transformation away from gentrification does contribute to give a sense of place trust and sense of belonging to to the place and uh, you know we live these cities we are participants too right so Sinisha panelist audience thank you very much for contributing to this conversation again this has been recorded so you can find it in the YouTube channel from uh, Morgan State University of course for who is interested, the AIA credits have been, uh, um, you know, will be given for this lecture. 
Uh, Kylie also helped me thinking as our sponsors, of course, because without them, this would not have happened. Next week, next Tuesday, February the 28th, we will have, the mo our moderator will be Selena Abrams. We will be talking about the general, the generous, generous city. Panelists will be Design Collective, Group for Architecture, Design Collective, Baltimore, Group for Architecture, Rotterdam, Jerome Gray Architects, Baltimore, and OMA from Rotterdam. Thank you again, and I hope to see you soon on this side or the other side of the pond. Have a nice evening. Wow, that was Have a nice great. Evening. Bye.